Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Communicating as a Leader versus a Manager and start by introducing Louisa Ferrer, who is going to get us started this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our webinar on Communicating as a Leader versus as a Manager. As Kim said, I'm Louisa Ferreira, and I'm the head of the social program at the European Investment Bank Institute and I'll be your host for today's webinar. This webinar is part of a series of webinars we've been designing principally for the SIT uh, alumni that are open to everyone interested in these topics. Let me introduce you to the speaker that many of you already know from some of the programs we run to uh, and offer our alumni, as well as from our some previous webinars, Kim Van Nikerke, Kim is a communications coach and a lecturer at the Institute of Fundraising in UK. Before I give the camera and the mic to Kim, I would like to share with you a couple of logistical points from today's webinar. The first one is that the audio for this event, we hope so, will be recorded and will be available to all attendees at our uh, YouTube channel in about three or four business days. The second one is how we're going to run the webinar. Uh, there are two options, and the Kim can show you on the screen now the slide for you to communicate with us. One is using the Q&A box, and the other one is the chat box. If uh, we would prefer that you use the chat box because it's much easier to only focus on one, uh, so if you can do that, we would rather uh, welcome you to ask your Q and the questions on the chat box. The other one is during the Q&A session, if it's possible, we may uh, let you ask uh, and share with uh, us some of your thoughts with the group. And if that's the case, let us know in the chat box and I'll try to give you the mic. So it's going to be a challenge, but we'll try our best. So, Kim, without further ado, I don't give you the floor, but I give you the mic and the camera. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Louisa. And absolutely wonderful as ever to see some of those familiar names from our SIT finalists. And welcome to the rest of you who are joining us, perhaps even for the first time at one of our webinars. Uh, it's always a challenge for me every time I have the privilege of sharing time with you all uh, to uh, think about how do I condense everything I want to say into uh, such a short space of time. But uh, I'm going to share with you what I hope uh, is a flavor, a taster of how different it can be communicating as a leader versus a manager. And this passion space for me, and I actually said to Louise, I really want to do a webinar on this space because for, for 10 years I've been studying teams and looking at the different nuances between when we need to have our have, you know, communication as a manager and when we need communication as a leader and the differences. <clears throat> now, Instead of uh, this being a, a webinar that's going to be a series of, and here's what you should say, and here's how you should say it, um, I think Google gives you plenty of options for that. Uh, and I'm not a big fan of that approach. And the reason I'm not a big fan is because if I tell you what to say as a leader or as a manager, it's going to sound like me, and it won't end up sounding like you. And that's where we lose our authenticity in how we're communicating. So what I would rather do is today take you on a tour of how to find your authentic communication style, whether that's for management or for leadership, uh, and take you down this path. Because um, I don't know if any of you have ever come across Charles Handy. He's a very famous author in the world of business and management. Uh, he's definitely one of my all-time heroes in terms of the academics that I've studied. But Charles Handy, I remember very clearly a long time ago in, a, in a, 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 an old book of his saying, there are either managers or there are leaders. And I think that uh, he's definitely right. We definitely come across natural leaders or natural managers, and particularly how they communicate. But what's challenging is that in today's day and age, we actually need to be both. 
we often find ourselves in situations where we need to be great at managing and 10 minutes later need to recognize we need to move into a leadership style of communicating. So with all the respect in the world for Charles Handy, I'm today going to get you thinking about the value and importance of flexing your communication styles between the two. But let's crack on and start having a look at what this is going to look like. So over the course of our webinar time, I'm going to just kick us off by defining management and leadership, because this is one of the most hotly debated um, topics of you know, what is management versus leadership and where is the boundary. And it's so important for us to start there so we can then go on to talk about what are the characteristics of leadership and how they change communication and indeed what are the characteristics of management and how they change communication. So we'll take you through a tour of all of that and then that should lead us to about quarter two, uh, quarter to five if you're in uh, European Central Time, at which point we'll love to take some of your questions and then we will run a very, very short poll at the end just to ask you how you found this particular webinar. If I don't get time to cover any of your questions or the things you want clarification on that you didn't get time to chat to me about, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to take questions. So let's get started and look at this definition of management. Uh, now, when I went and had a good Google of how we define management, these are some of the things that came up. So it was that you forecast, you plan, you organize, you command, you coordinate, control, set the strategy, supervise and direct a group of people. Or it might be that it's a process of dealing with or controlling things or people. So that is how we tend to define management at the moment. It's very much about process of what's going on. So what I'd love you to do is hopefully you've all found that chat box. Uh, just take a moment for me just to write into that chat box some of your thoughts of what characteristics come to mind for you of someone who makes for a great manager then. If this is what managing is, what characteristics does a great manager need to have? So have a go at just typing in to that chat box for me. Some answers to what are the characteristics of great managers for you? Okay, I'm just gonna give you a moment to do that. Loving these questions. So, good listener, knowing how to delegate, emotional intelligence, having control, determination. I love this. And notice how different your answers are as well. Um, being consistent, being trustworthy, being a good communicator. Um, couldn't agree more with that. Taking control and listening. Great, beautiful set of examples. And what was interesting when I was thinking about it, one of the first ones that came to mind for me was actually, if you're going to make sure all of these things are getting done, one of the characteristics that needs to be really clear for a communicator is being clear, so having clarity. So let's take a look at some of that clarity then. So what I wanted to propose is that actually, our management communication starts with our way of being. And for those of you who've worked with me before, you know I'm a massive fan of this um, concept of have, do, be. So we want to have great uh, projects, products, outcomes from all our managing. Therefore, what we need to do is all the planning and the coordinating and the analysis then the directing, everything we just heard described in those definitions. But now the question I've really asked you is how do we need to be in order to do all of that? So this is like what ways of being does your team need you to be as a manager? And that's really the question that we start with when we start talking about what does it mean to be a great communicator as a manager? So as I was saying, one of the things I really think it is, is about communicating from clarity, so being clear as a manager. Now, if you're being clear, then one of the things you look to do is 
use shorter sentences. We're not going to put these big, long, difficult, complex sentences in place because that doesn't help us to be clear. We're going to maybe communicate about the action that needs to be or will be taken because that gives clarity on what you need to have happen. You're going to put deadlines in, which is so um, important. There are going to be clear outcomes that you're going to be expecting. So there is a lovely balance between if I'm being clear, how am I communicating? I'm doing it in all of these different ways. Now, if we were being something else other than clear or having clarity, what other ways could we be? Well, we might say in this, we could be confused, right, as an alternative. So being confused would mean that actually when I communicated, that I wasn't being absolutely clear on what action needs to be taken or should be taken. I wouldn't be clear about deadlines. I wouldn't be clear about outcomes expected. So one of the most important things we have to touch in with ourselves is to recognize what is the state that we're in and how does that affect us as a manager? And one of the nice things is that the answer to how should you communicate as a manager really is just what is needed from you in this moment. If what you've identified in some of the, um, the chat box there is things like, uh, I need to be a good listener. Well, how do you show you've listened in your communication? You're going to reply back and articulate, I've heard that this is what you need. I've heard that this is what's important. You're feeding it back to demonstrate you're being a good listener. If you need to be, I'm just going to scroll back through some of your messages um, and say, if it's about being consistent, then your communication needs to demonstrate consistency all the way through. And that's about saying, what is my narrative? How am I going to talk about things? And how am I going to make sure I'm always talking about those things? So really the question always comes back to this place of, how do I need to be as a manager in this moment with my team? What is it that they need from me? And then putting myself into a place of saying, right, I'm going to be clear. None of what I've said here is rocket science. I think all of you could have said, well, yeah, if I'm going to be clarity, of course I'm going to use shorter sentences. Of course I'm going to communicate the actions. But what doesn't tend to happen is that we don't check in with ourselves about the way of being that we need to be in that given moment. So let me move on. If we take leadership, now, the definition of leadership here and how, how it's understood, I mean, you can find 500 defin different definitions of leadership. So I've chosen two that I really, really recognize and can relate to. Uh, one is, is by Seth Godin, who's written, I mean, umpteen brilliant books. If you haven't picked up a Seth Godin book, please do. The one in particular that's wonderful is one called Tribes, of how as a leader you do build a following. And he talks a lot about communication in that book as well. But he says, uh, management is about manipulating. So you can see how uh, much he enjoys the idea of management. It, manipulating resources to get a job done, whereas leadership is about creating change that you believe in. Uh, and I love this idea of it's about creating change that you have a belief in. And we're going to come on to more of that. The second one is from uh, something called Handbook for Teaching Leadership. It's a, a program that's being taught through Harvard at the moment. Uh, and the authors, Erhard Janssen, Saffron and Granger, are a fairly formidable team. But I absolutely love how they define leadership. They say it's an exercise in language. So, you know, they kind of had me at language. But that results in the realization of a future that wasn't going to happen anyway. So this is something that if everyone had been left to their own devices, this wouldn't have come about without the intervention of leadership. And this future fulfills or contributes to the concerns of the relevant parties. 
So what it's really starting to pick up on is this is us saying, what does everyone want to see happening? What is the shared interest in this group? Whether that's your company, your team, a group of people in your community, we're connecting in and saying, what is it that everyone wants to see happen, even if they don't know how it could happen? And we're going to start looking at that. So this definition of leadership for me, I hope you can start to see just how distinct it is from the definition of management. Management about the process of how you get something done and how you get it done efficiently. And leadership being about how you create a picture of a goal that is a shared goal of a group of people and how you get them to that place. So if we move on then and start looking at what then are the characteristics of leadership communication? For me, there are two really clear ones. The first is that you need to come from a place of empathy in order to understand the shared interests of your group. So if you are looking to be a better leader within your, across your colleagues, and leadership, by the way, I do not recognize it as something that's hierarchical. So it's not about, I am a manager, therefore I am a leader. Um, what we're talking about is, is that if you see that you need to take or want to take a leadership role, this is the characteristic to demonstrate. So it's that you show you have really understood what is important to the group that you're working with. And secondly, then we look at the fact that you develop an absolute blind faith, a belief, an unwavering belief that it is possible to deliver the change that your group wants to see happen or to deliver the project that your group wants to see happen, even if they can't see how it could materialize. So we're going to take a look at those two points in turn now, first being empathy, and then we'll take a look at faith. So first of all, we're going to look at communicating from empathy. Now, what we really mean when we say communicating from empathy is that this is about telling the story of who your group is and the future that you are building or the goal that you are working towards and building. So a true empathetic leader can understand a group, show them that they're understood, and then translate this into a story about who that group is and create a passionate goal for change. Now, this, uh, this, this voice uh, differs a lot to a manager's voice. So a manager, a manager's voice might describe the process of change as uh, the process of it. So I'm going to take an example of, um, I've been thinking about one of our SIT finalists a lot over the last week, uh, which is Fire, which is one of the Portuguese um, teams that took part uh, last year. Uh, they uh, take, well, I'll tell you, through the manager's communication voice. So someone from Fire describing it through the management voice would say, we take produce from farmers that retailers don't want and we distribute it to locals. So that's how I would communicate what Fruitsifier does, so from a management process angle. Now, if I wanted to tell the story of their group and the goal that they have, it would sound completely different. I would probably say uh, that the message they would put out would be, we are a team of young activists creating a future free of food waste in Portugal. So I hope you can see the difference between describing the process as a manager and describing the story and goal from a leadership point of view. Now, what I'd love you to do is take a moment to reflect on how do you talk about your job or your team? Do you think that your voice is more from the manager's voice of we talk about the process and the procedures and how we do things? Or are you telling a narrative and a story about who you are as a team? So again, just jot down into that chat group for me. Anything that you're reflecting on of, mm, am I talking about myself and the work we do from a management point of view? Or do I talk about it from leadership? And maybe some of you do both. So have a little pop of that into the chat box for me.
Do you think you are communicating from a place of management? Are you telling the story? Great, lovely to see from our first message that there's some of both. So what becomes really nice is as you become conscious of both is to notice that this is my management voice and this is my leadership voice. Uh, Joao, you said, I always tell our story, our mission, our passion. Ah, oh, there's the leader. That's the leader communicating very clearly. And I've heard you talking like that too. Now, the other thing that starts to happen is when we start talking from communicating from this place of empathy is that we want to tell the collective desire for the change that we're wanting to see. Now, if that's the case, uh, we might hear sort of fire, for example, saying uh, just as it's telling their story, but it's adding a real desire to it. You know, we want a world where no food is growing using our planet and people resource only to then be thrown away. So notice that the delivery changes just a little bit because it starts to come from a different place. So if you want to be one of the most powerful communications, uh, leadership communication voices, this is the goal, is to start telling your story and telling the desire that you have. And also within this, there is a voice that says, this is about what we want, not what I want. And sometimes as a manager, we have to have a voice that's very much about, I would like you to do this. I would like to see this happening. And there can be quite a strong eye voice. In leadership, we're increasingly seeing that where successful leaders communicate from, they communicate from a place of the team, of the organization, and very, very rarely do you hear the I voice coming in. In fact, if you're keen to see research on some, what really makes truly great leaders stand out from the rest, there was a beautiful piece of research done by a chap called Jim Collins, and his book is called Good to Great, where he studied a number of big businesses and looked at what were the characteristics of the leaders that made the organizations who consecutively beat the stock market stand out. Why were they so much more successful than everyone else? And they were really shocked by their findings. The finding ultimately was that there was somebody who described the story of their group and goal, they had a very, very clear goal in mind, pretty much to be the best. And they told it with an absolute unwavering desire for that to happen and always, always communicated it as a, this is what we need to do, what's right for us, never putting themselves in the spotlight. Now, uh, I also think about a quote um, in that moment when we talk about leadership voices and communicating from empathy uh, from Edmund Hillary, who was the great uh, New Zealand Kiwi explorer. I don't know if any of you have ever come across him. Um, but there's a quote from him that said, reaching the summit of a mountain gives great satisfaction. But nothing for me has been more rewarding in life than the result of our climb on Everest when we've devoted ourselves to the welfare of our Sherpa friends. And even in that moment when he's talking about this incredible conquest that he very much led, he talks about it through the eyes of the team and the group that got him there. And I think that's another thing we have to really bear in mind for communicating from this place of leadership that it's from and all about our team and what we're delivering as our team. Now, the other element of communicating from this place of leadership is communicating from this blind faith, this absolute belief in the goal and it being reached. Now, heading to a goal is about creating change. And I don't know how many of you hear the word change or change management around your organization, but I hear it a lot. I often get pulled into, you know, moments in companies and organizations where they're going through change. And change is uncertain. Change is scary. Humans are not built to uh, enjoy change. We are creatures of habit. So a leader needs to hold faith for others when they don't have it themselves. 
when they feel the fear of change, of we don't know how we're going to get to this goal, we don't know how we're going to achieve this project, a leader's voice and its communication needs to say, as I have in this image, we've got this, you've got this. So it's an absolute belief in the team and the resources you have. Now, I want you to think about some of the great leaders that you can think of when those come to mind. Again, take a, a, a quick moment to think about who would you list as someone who is a great leader and just pop it into the chat box. What names come to mind for you when you think of great leaders and great uh, people at communicating in their leadership? So I'll give you a moment just to... Bill Gates, yeah, and isn't he doing a great job of it at the moment? Obama, Bob Iger, Elon Musk, Oprah, absolutely. And you can absolutely hear a belief in those voices when you're listening to them. Nelson Mandela, you know, I couldn't agree more. So, you know, can you imagine if Nelson Mandela had said, um, you know, maybe we'll end apartheid. It's a really good goal. Um, so let's hopefully try and do that. You know, it would have been crazy to hear him saying that. Instead, uh, at the very famous Ravonia trials, when he gave a three-hour speech, uh, he said, this is an ideal for which I'm prepared to die. You know, the belief in this cause, in this project, was absolutely concrete. Uh, so one of the things I want you to reflect on is how concrete and how strong is my faith as I'm communicating? Because we all have bad days. There are all days when we think, oh, was this really a good idea? Can I really do this? Can my team really do this? Have we really even got the resources to pull this off? You know, we all have those doubts. And I work a lot with um, social enterprises and nonprofits or teams that are really, really stretched for time or other resources. And there's always this sense of, well, we could get there if we had this, this, and this. And this is where this leadership voice becomes absolutely at its best. Because what it's really saying is that as a leader, uh, you can... Uh, make a very different message than if you're a manager. A manager would look at, we don't have enough resource, therefore we can't do it, right? It's a supply issue. Whereas a leader looks at a situation where there is an imperfect situation, imperfect resources, perfect time, whatever it might be, and says, what can we do even in this imperfection? And it asks, a leader asks for change to be possible even in a completely imperfect world. So they don't deny that there is a lack of resource, a lack of time, a lack of, you know, whatever it might be, or a lack of skill set. But they say, can we do it anyway? And that's a very, very different message. And what I call this is holding duality. So you can be both present to the reality of, yes, we have limited resources, or it's an imperfect time, imperfect scenario, and how do we make it happen? And that's a message that is absolutely part of our leadership voice. And you'll notice I've highlighted the key word in that consistently is always and. Um, a leader can acknowledge failures and challenges and the possibility of success anyway. You know, think about the people who've gone and achieved things that no one thought was possible, built things no one thought was possible, been to places no one thought was possible. Because there's a leadership voice and a message that holds the faith that we could try and we could get there. Uh, I'm always reminded of a crisis management moment that I was brought into a couple of years ago. And one of the techniques we were looking at is how do you communicate as a man, as a, a leader from a leader's place when there's a crisis going on that is devastating for the organization. And yet you want to keep customer, stakeholder, supporter safe 
in what's going on in the organization. And this and word pretty much was the savior in that crisis moment. Because communicating as a leader from faith says, this crisis is happening, it's devastating. They even unpacked how they felt as a team. And we absolutely know and believe we can recover from it. So holding this duality is a very, very powerful message that you can send out to people. Uh, and a leader will shine a focus in their communication on the part that's helpful to stand out, on the, where our efforts should remain. So in that duality of things are going wrong, the world is imperfect, uh, and it's still possible to reach our goal, the leader says through that kind of communication, I'd like our focus to be on how we can still reach our goal. And that's where you get a really, really powerful message coming out and inspiring a team to keep steady and keep moving forward towards their goal. But it's not easy to stay in that place. So one of the other things that a leader has to be able to do is not only communicate from a place of faith, but to be comfortable communicating from a duality in themselves. Even leaders feel doubt and fear and anxiety. And I'm sure any of you who've had to take on a leadership role at some point have felt all of those things, you know? How is this going to work? But great leaders communicate that duality to bring the authenticity to their team. So they say things like, there have been moments, <coughs> excuse me, when I've worried about budget, when I've worried about our deadlines, and I also know there's a team here that can get us over the line and make it happen. So you're constantly being open about the duality of feeling the fear and trusting that you can absolutely still hit your goal. And where I said here that great leaders can also mirror the strengths in their group, what I really mean by that is that great leaders, when they're communicating to people, don't communicate to their weakest parts. They communicate to their strongest parts. So um, I'm thinking about... Uh, Oh, an example I'll bring up a bit later, but um, when you have a team and they are demonstrating their flaws, they're even sharing their flaws with you, to sit and allow that to be the case and think about how am I going to manage it will be a management process. But a leader would communicate with someone in that moment from a place of, I see that you want to get stronger in X areas and I can see your strengths in these areas. And I also can see your potential to grow and develop into those other things. So they hold a belief in individuals and their team that even with the imperfections that somebody has, they absolutely can and will get stronger. And there's nothing like watching uh, somebody really begin to shine and come out of their shell when they have a leader who sees their greatness, sees their potential, and communicates to it. The other thing that we see when a leader communicates um, from a place of both empathy and faith is that they really have to live by the standards that um, they're talking about. When a, a leader says, we can feel the fear and do it anyway, they have to be able to demonstrate that they are feeling the fear and doing it anyway. And in fact, this is one of the, the key points that Jim Collins came up in his book, Good to Great as well, is that all of these leaders consecutively said, I hold myself accountable to the standards that I'm holding you to. So these leaders know that one of the greatest goals they have is keeping themselves in check. And so leadership communication really, when we're talking about how they need to hold themselves in check, 
starts with their way of being, starts with our way of being when we're being leaders. And just the same as being in a manager, we can have this concept of have, do, be. I want to have a team that's inspired and knows the goal and knows where they're headed and knows that they can get there. And what do I have to do in order to, say, in order to achieve that? Well, you have to be able to describe that vision really beautifully and clearly, but you also have to be at this place of empathy and this place of absolute faith that your team can get there and lots of other ways. So what ways of being does your goal and your team need you to be as a leader is the question I have for you. And this takes a bit of time to unpick this as a question. But if you think about there is no right or wrong leadership, it's just what's needed and helpful as a leadership style within your team, for your project, right now, for your organization right now. What are the qualities of leadership? So I've picked out the two from the definition of empathy and faith. But what else do you think it takes to be a powerful leader communicator? So have a go again at thinking about what are the qualities of powerful leaders. You might, might want to think back to some of the people you mentioned, like Martin Luther King and Mandela and Oprah and Obama and those names. What are their ways of being that make them so powerful? Passion, and I love that, absolutely. They communicate from a place of being passionate. Ah, David also picking up passion. Andrew, clear, honest, absolutely. I also think uh, some of the best leaders are compassionate and understanding as well. I love this, yeah, different to unexpected, transparent, absolutely. In fact, I had an email recently um, from somebody and uh, they were in a leadership role and they were having to communicate a very difficult scenario related around fees for their product. But they openly said, we are going to be completely honest with you. And they unpacked all the detail of where their finances stood. And it was so powerful in terms of leadership. You want them to be able to resonate with a wide range of a wide, wide, wide audience, absolutely. Uh, genuine, constructive. Right, I love this. So you're clear on these ways of being. So my question then is actually now, if you put yourself and you're saying, right, I'm going to be passionate, I'm going to be transparent, I'm going to be genuine, and I'm going to be constructive, what does your voice sound like when you communicate from that place? Because you are going to say things with an energy and a passion it's really exciting. And I'm just reading really Drago, I think it's very important to transmit calm. Absolutely. In the worst situations. I think I couldn't I couldn't agree more. That comes back to that belief element. If you are a calm in a crisis, it's signal to the rest of your team that, that it's okay, that you will find a way through it. Understanding the aspects of your subject is showing people that you understand, absolutely. So you know the answers, right? But what doesn't happen very often is us communicating from these places, right? We kind of go, oh, that's how Obama does it. But actually, this is how you can do it as long as you are checking in with your state before you communicate. Now, I've been guilty of it in the last couple of months, uh, of the last month, and I've watched a lot of people doing exactly the same. But we often communicate as leaders on the sort of cuff, you know, last minute you're cornered and someone asks you to say something, and it comes from whatever state you're in. So if you're feeling anxious about something, fearful about something, and you communicate from a place of fear as a leader, you can imagine how different it would start to sound. If I communicated to my team about the future of our business from a place of fear, I would say awful things, really take them down a dark place. And so communicating from a place of calm becomes really, really crucial. 
And I don't have to give you the words. You can start to imagine and even pick scenarios where you can say, actually, I know I've communicated from a place of anger or a place of fear or a place of anxiety before. And that hasn't given me the leadership voice that I wanted. So that becomes the goal of how we stay really focused on this is how I want to be. And if I'm going to be transparent and passionate, this is how it sounds. And these are the words and this is the voice that I start to find. So what we start to see is that leadership or management and our communication it's not about being perfect in our communication. Actually, more than anything else, it's about empathizing with the goal and the team and understanding who they need you to be in that moment. And you asking yourself, as a manager, who do I need to be for my team at the moment? As a leader, who do I need to be for my team at the moment? And the What's uh, a lovely quote that came to mind for me as I was prepping this webinar was one by Karl Marx, where he supposedly uh, said that the times we're in produce the person and not the other way round. And today's managers and leaders, I think, sadly, are not in a situation where they can just become the people they are based on the environment and the experiences they're having. We need to take our leaders and our managers to a place where they are conscious of who they are being, because that is what dictates how they then communicate to their team. So I'm going to, uh, I can see we've already got a couple more extra questions coming in. So I'm going to move us on to then giving us time to talk about our questions. Now, if you'll just give me a moment, if there's any questions you've got that you want to add into the chat box. Okay. So I'm going to share with you, Kim, one of the questions we received beforehand, and it is, does the non-verbal communication work for the tool? Absolutely. There's never a moment when non-verbal communication isn't at work. Um, the, some of you, I think, may have heard me talk about polyvagal theory. It's one of the most exciting uh, advances in communication that we've seen in the last, um, well, in the last decade. Uh, Stephen Porges was the researcher who looked to see that everything that we think, everything that we feel, uh, and all of the sensations we experience uh, are translated into our body language. So even if you think you are hiding your fear or hiding your anxiety, whether you're being in a management communication space or a leadership communication space, those things are coming out in your non-verbal language. And it will come through in uh, irritated twitching and scratching or, uh, you know, maybe it does come across in crossing your arms or sitting back but we are constantly communicating through our bodies. And that doesn't matter whether it's um, in your management or your leadership. So constantly the key thing is to come back to this same point of, where am I right now? Am I actually really angry and frustrated about things? In which case I need to go and shake that off, get myself to a place where I'm able to get myself to calm, get myself to passionate, get myself to clear, and then communicate from that place. So a lot of this really is about uh, you uh, and your inner leadership to communicate well, either as a manager or a leader. So I hope that covers the question of, does it work for both? Okay, Kim, I have another question for you, which I think you already answered part of it, but it goes, how would communication as a leader versus as a manager would work across different communication cultures. I think you've already responded part of the second uh, part of the question, whether there are any universal communication traits that would constitute good leadership, but maybe you want to say something more about that, about the cultural aspect. Yeah, um, culture and communication is a huge topic matter. Um, 
I think the one thing that we had to really just bottle it down is do you care to get it right? If you're aware that you've got multiple cultures, do you care to communicate well with each of them? Because if I was gonna to say to you, right, go into a place of being that's a place where I'm saying, I care to get it right, then one of the things you might say to somebody is, I'm only familiar with communicating in these cultures. I really want to make sure that we have a great working relationship and please tell me if at any point I happen to offend or um, get things wrong in my communication if it's interpreted differently in your culture. Because that just shows somebody that you care and gives you the opportunity to have a dialogue openly about when it goes wrong. You cannot study the ins and outs of every single culture, particularly when you work in a really multicultural environment, but you can make it clear to people that you care to get it right. So don't worry about being perfect but communicate in the beginning from a place of caring. And yes, I think uh, if I had to pick out universal communication traits that constitute good leadership, it would be empathy and uh, faith, those two things. That without that, people love it when they feel understood and people want to follow someone who believes that something's possible, especially if it's what they believe, that what they want to see happening. Thank you, Kim. Another question, which is, what about your advice when it's written communication? Mm. Well, the lovely thing about this as an approach is that um, it's really the same thing. Every time you sit down to write, and this is polyvagal theory all over, so polyvagal theory will say, if you are in a place of fear, if you're in a place of anxiety, for example, your mind, your brain cannot find the words that are gonna be the most passionate, the most powerful. Instead, it finds the words that are related to your place of fear and your anxiety. Uh, even if you're handwriting something, your handwriting can change if you're in a place of being angry versus being in a place of passionate, determined, excited. So everything comes down to always checking in with where am I before I write this? Do I really want to send this in my management role from a place where I'm not feeling certain? So perhaps you need to go away and do that before you start writing that email. Um, but also, I mean, I think what I'd really say is take care with your words. Words are precious. Um, have them come out of you from a place that you're conscious of. You know, communicate from a place where you said, I'm, this is where I want my words to come out of. And it doesn't matter whether they're written or whether they're verbal. Um, a manager I was working with recently said that she turned to her team and said, just sort yourselves out and just get on with it. And I said to her, right, so what place was that communicated from? And eventually she said, actually, no, it, it came from a complete place of fear inside me. And I said, okay, well, if instead you picture yourself at your most confident, your most relaxed, your most caring, what would you have chosen to say to them in that moment instead? And she said, you guys have got this. And it wasn't that the situation had changed. It was that she was able to put herself into a different place. And now you can imagine the difference in reaction she would have got from the team that heard to sort yourselves out versus the team that would have heard, you guys have absolutely got this. So it doesn't matter whether it's writing or verbal, it's all about this place in the state. I cannot, I cannot see any question right now on the chat box. Maybe they, will, they were sent directly to you, so do you want to check the, your chat box? Otherwise, Good. Yes, so I'm just saying that we've got one question about do we need to hide our fears? I think that authentic communication says no, we don't need to hide our fears. But you might want to check in with yourself about how legitimate your fears are in the first place. So one of the nice things you can do is go away and have a conversation with yourself 
before you have a communication with your team and just check in and say, okay, I'm fe definitely feeling fear. Great. Is this true? Is it true that this is the only scenario? This is the only thing that could be happening? Is my fear the only reality? And you'll be able to reflect on this question. So the person asked me this question will be able to say yes or no. But most of the time we could say, I, can, I feel a fear, but it's not my only reality. There's also another reality where everything could be completely okay. Or even if it's not okay, I'll find a way, we'll find a way through it and past it. So you need to have that conversation with yourself first, because otherwise what tends to happen is you go up and you talk about your fears and they all come pouring out of you and everyone's like, wow, there's a lot of fear coming from our leader. And you want to be able to present the balance. So once you've had that conversation with yourself, you can come forward and say, you know, this, I felt this fear, I've had this fear about whatever happening. And I also know that this is possible. And that's where you get a nice balance. Now, if you hide your fears, it comes out as a bit of like brainwashing. Don't worry, it's all going to be fine. And people can still, still hear the fear in your voice behind it. Uh, and you're telling them it's all going to be okay, it will be okay. And we can hear it. We can hear it in your pace, in your choice of words. But if you unpack it with the, it is this and it's this. And you've had that conversation with yourself before it comes out much much differently lovely so i hope that's answered that question uh bum, bum, bum. i've had the question about how do we how do we shake it up um brilliant um but i'm not sure which bit that relates to so for the person who asked me the question how do you shake it up um if you want to just give me a little bit more detail i can um i can take you through an answer to that and I'm just going to check the Q&A here as well. Um, dun -dun. So I've just got comments really coming through in the Q&A. So if, again, if anyone anything is slightly more specific, I'm really happy to take a closer look. Okay. So I, I think that's perhaps all of our questions that have come in so far. Um, uh, what I would love to do though is say, if any of you have got any further questions, please of course feel free to get in touch. We're going to be running webinars uh, throughout the rest of this quarter, unpacking even more about language and communication. So we hope you come back and uh, we'll share some more as well. Uh, we would love before you go, first of all, say thank you so much for joining us, but please don't go anywhere unless we can get you to do this poll for us. Now, I need to find a way to make sure we can uh, get you to do the poll, Louisa. Denise is on it. I just would like to thank you for another great webinar, and I would like to share with all the attendees that will have another webinar on a different topic, the IB response to the COVID crisis in early May, so stay tuned. The poll is there so everyone can answer and then leave. And thank you so much for listening to this excellent webinar and thank you, Kim, for Absolutely. another great one. Thank you.